What's up? And we're on. What's up, Grillo? Luis Chaparro. Nice to see you here, man. Like we've been talking a lot lately. We I feel like we uh I feel like we fucking live together now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that might be a bit too far. But um, but yeah, it's a good, it's a good uh, good talking. So uh so talking about that, um let's talk about your town, man. Sierra Juarez. Yes, the, yes. The, the Juarez Cartel. The Juarez Cartel. I mean, before we jump right into it, before we go and dive to the history of uh, Juarez Cartel, I think my doubt is, is it exists or, because, uh, you know, like, it's it's been forever changing. So I don't know if it's uh, an organization that exists um, up until this day. Does the Juarez Cartel exist, the new thing? But let's get back to the history. I mean, if we call the Juarez Cartel the the major drug trafficking network from Ciudad Juarez. Mm -hmm. um, okay, let's talk about Ciudad Juarez first of all. I mean, you know, your town, you were born there. Tell people, you know, where is it? Ciudad is it Juarez for? is right across El Paso, Texas, is a border hub of some 1.4 million people, although the floating population, the population that goes back and forth from, from, from El Paso and Chihuahua and stuff. We're talking about like about 4 million people border plex around or so. Um, it's, uh, I mean, it's not a huge town to be, to be pretty honest, but it's, uh, it's very strategic for not only for, for drugs or, you know, like human smuggling, but also like for all sorts of imports, export as just being a, a border. And to my understanding, well, it's it's located in the north part of the state of Chihuahua, which is the biggest state in, in Mexico, a state that collides with Sinaloa and Sonora uh, on, on the south. And uh, and I think it's uh, it's it's one of the plazas that it will be cool like also to talk about what is a plaza, right? What's it's one of the one of the cities, one of the turfs that was uh probably one of the most important hubs for import export drugs and yeah that's my hometown i was born here 36 years ago and um and i'm not sure if i can call myself a juarense because i go back and forth but i guess all juarenses are at the same time from el paso and el paseños are also from juarez it's hard to tell man also known as juaritos y el chuco juaritos y el chuco two interesting things about juarez this is the place where El Burrito was born and the place where La Margarita was born. Although Tijuana always wants to claim that Margarita was invented in Tijuana, but it was invented at the Kentucky Club in Ciudad Juarez, right across the bridge from El Paso. Now, it's funny, Tijuana claims Margarita, they also claim the fucking Caesar salad. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I, mean, I mean, what's cooler, the, the burrito or the Caesar salad? Uy. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't think the Caesar salad was invented in Tijuana, man. <laughs> I know, I know, Tijuanenses always wanted to say that it was, <laughs> but they, they just want to claim something because I mean, the margarita, <laughs> they want to claim margarita, and it's like, dude, that's that's in Juarez, don't don't try to claim it. And they're like, okay, then the margarita, probably not. But what about the Caesar salad? <laughs> it's like, so, sure. so what's the story? Why is the burrito called the burrito? Oh, there's a lot of versions, but uh, I'll tell you just one, the one that I believe it's more, probably more accurate. It is because migrants coming to, trying to go into the U.S. had their lunch. Um, they were carrying their lunch as if they were donkeys, you know, traían su, su lonche. It was easier to wrap their, whatever they were uh, eating, frijoles or, you know, like beans or rice or meat wrapped up in a tortilla and then carry that on their shoulder al along with water and stuff like if they were donkeys yeah it was uh, in español uh, they donkeys a burro so they were like ay vienen los burritos that's what so, I, that's what i've heard so i had a version version i heard was you had the mines nearby it's like mines nearby juarez or something the, uh, yeah, people yeah. go and work in the mines and they come out for lunch and the burritos would come guys would come on donkeys with the with the food so oh yeah been in los burritos mm, 
Well, I mean, it makes sense. It's also, it's, it's, it sounds kind of like the same. I mean, it's still related to the fucking donkeys, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So talking about donkeys, let's get this get let's get to the business of the Juarez drug trafficking <laughs> cartel. Um so okay, so I mean trafficking probably goes way back. Well, actually it does go way back because Juarez, you've got uh La Nacha. La Nacha, yes. So way before the Juarez cartel. Yeah. You've got La Nacha. Who's La Nacha then? La Nacha trafficking uh, basically opium, right? To um to the U.S., pro- probably serving specifically the uh, U.S. military back in the what twenties. Yeah, um, she said to be the first narco, or the first, or the first narca, pues, but it was, it was a woman, one of the first, one of the OGs who started this uh, drug trafficking business, making also business with the Chinese community. That was uh, the Chinese community was huge in, in Ciudad Juarez and in Tijuana, Mexicali. Um, back then, and allegedly, she was getting all of that, uh, all of that stuff from from them, or at least they were helping boost her her trafficking organization. And she, her name was Ignacia Jasso, if I'm not mistaken, right? Known as yeah. La Nacha. Then, so I heard some stuff there, or read some stuff, and there's there's a bunch of stuff in the newspapers from the time about this. Um, a newspaper El Continental or something. I remember reading some of those archives. Um, but like she was selling, I think she had a house in Juarez where she'd sell a lot of the, I think some of it was heroin, like processed heroin yeah. already mm-hmm. back then in the twenties. And people, so people would go down to like La Nacha, people would come down from like New Mexico around the, the, the military base in Texas, but also like jazz musicians of those days would go mm-hmm. down and like La Nacha and, and it's by the, the heroin now also about the Chinese. Apparently, there's a bunch of Chinese people selling heroin as well. And there was some trigger right. man for her called El Pablito or something, El Pablote. El Pablote. Uh-huh. El Pablote, who like buried all these Chinese guys yeah. and took over the trade, yeah? Exactly. And El Pablote, I mean, th- there is a, there is an article also in one of these old newspapers saying, and there's also one of the first narco corridos, one of the first, uh, you know, like drug ballads, was if not the first one was in nineteen nineteen seventeen, um, and it was about a Pablote and how he was killed, or no, no, not probably not nineteen seventeen, probably twenty seven. I can't remember, but it was like really early about how a Pablote was killed by a scared police officer. Everybody like was scared of a Pablote, so a Pablote entered this cantina and he saw a couple of policemen at the cantina, and they gave out a look. The police officer was like, ah, oh, he's about to kill me. So he grabbed his gun. And then Pablote wanted to say something or he was trying to probably get rid of the fucking police officer. Said so like, hey, get the fuck out of this place. And this scared police officer, bam, shot him in the head, killed the Pablote almost by mistake. And that's the story of one of the first, according to Juan Carlos Pimienta, the, these, uh, these um, academic from the San Diego University who is a, uh, who wrote several books about about narco corridos he said that that was the first narco corrido considered as a narco corrido um wow la muerte uh, del pablote or something yeah, <laughs> it's, called, it's, called, yeah, it's called el pablote like just Pablo, Pablo. okay okay yeah. wow so, so back in those days now i guess to get into you know there's always gonna be a lot of history there for, from the 40s and 50s but let's take it to the 80s yeah because there's so much stuff happening today and, and, and there's things we're seeing today with it. But the 80s, um, and then, so before you get Amado Carrillo Fuentes, mm. ACF, and one of the biggest drug traffickers in Mexican history, mm. emerging out of Sierra Juarez. So before him, we get a few players here, including El Greñas. Yes. And there's about four names I've seen Looking back uh, from names, I mean, Amado Carrillo Fuentes kind of rose up among various traffickers in the city. Mm-hmm. Um, but El Greñas was definitely the big one. And, and, and a lot, lot of the older, the older vets like Miguel Angel Perea, the master photographer, he's got a lot of Greñas stories. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
Yes, I mean, I can't remember the name of Algrenas, but uh, well, one of the one of the stories about Algrenas is that he allegedly kidnapped these two reporters from El Paso Times. Well, it was called El Paso Times, but I think it wasn't called El Paso Times. It was like El Paso Herald or some stuff like that. And he kidnapped these two reporters that came out to his door trying to get an interview. And he literally kidnapped them both, um, tortured them for a couple of days before letting them go. Uh, and I, th- these these is like in public records when you when you find about these two periodistas what kidnapped by by El Greñas in Juarez. Yeah, I, I heard about I heard about the case. I think one photographer wasn't it one photographer and reporter or something. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and uh, you know, friends of friends I've had people who knew them and stuff, and and they were pretty badly beaten up, I think, and you know, or tortured or whatever. I didn't realize that was Greñas who did that. So that was Greñas behind that. Yes, exactly. That was that was El Greñas. And eventually El Greñas got arrested. He kind of like disappeared from a public eye. Uh there's a there's one one only photo in a in, in a in a um in a newspaper from back then in Mexico because El Greñas was huge and then you see his photo when he was arrested and I think it I can't remember the the year but he was arrested his photo was in the newspaper on the front on the cover of a major newspaper actually I think it was El País who covered the story when he was arrested uh and then he kind of like disappeared you you like nobody knew about him people said that he died in jail people said that he's out or whatever but but in 2013 or so Right next to the uh, Lucerna Hotel in Ciudad Juarez, it's a huge parking lot. Uh, and that, that the parking lot, the Lucerna Hotel, and El Diario de Juarez that is right across used to be land owned by, by El Greñas. Uh, so one time I was trying to look for a parking spot and I found this huge parking lot, stayed there. And I kind of like recognized this face, you know, like this it was called Greñas because it has like puffy hair, you know, like, uh, and I, I asked one of the girls if they knew who El Greñas, one of the girls working there, who El Greñas was. So they, the, the parqueros, the, the, the people parking the cars, started gathering and saying like, that's El Greñas, man. So I, uh, allegedly, he went out from jail. The government only gave him back that land. He had no money. He had nothing, you know, but just that land. And he managed to put together a parking lot there and start, you know, like getting back and getting some money. And that's the story he told me right there. He didn't want to, to give me like a proper interview because he's like, dude, I don't want to be again like in the, uh, you know, like the eye of uh, the press or whatever. I, I just don't want to participate in any of this shit. Funny thing, a week later, he gets arrested. He gets all over the news in Ciudad Juarez and Chihuahua and, and Mexico. Because he beat up a prostitute <laughs> on his son's house at that oh, parking wow. lot. And so Gregas was back again in the newspapers. But uh, allegedly, he's still out there, man. I mean, I don't know if he's still, but 2013, he was literally um, managing his parking lot <laughs> in front of El so, so I had another story about him. Like, he used to, when he, I think when he was in prison one of the times, and he would still ride around on a motorbike in the prison yard and stuff, so on some big <laughs> motorbike. As a, but like, um, so okay, Grenias times eighties. Um, so that was before the cocaine really started to move in a massive way yes. in Juarez, and before uh, cartels are called and distributed as cartels, right? Like he only, yeah, yeah. yeah but but a bunch of gangs, a bunch of traffickers, and and maybe it's not even you know everyone can traffic and they might work together and do some deals together. Basically, people are allowed. You know, different traffickers are allowed there. Yeah. Um now Amado Carrillo Fuentes. So he emerges, and this is when the whole Juarez Cartel and all of these, these things kind of start to get known. Amado Carrillo Fuentes, ACF, uh, as the Americans like to call him in all the you know, ACF. Yeah. Um, so he is from Sinaloa. From Madiraguato, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I think uh, or Nabolato. Nabolato. Yes. In Nabolato, yeah. So he's from now he's a a police officer, I believe. I think so. And then he comes over and starts to, you know, rise up and you know right. basically he was he was brought by one of uh by one of his uh his uncle, no? Que era este way, uh, 
Uh, shit, what man? I can't I forget his name. It's um, uh, one of the, you know, it was Miguel Angel Felix, and then it was Carl Quintero, and then, ¿cómo se llama el otro? The other one? Uh, Neto Fonseca. Uh, and Neto Fonseca, yeah? Yes. He, so he, he, he was one of the ones who brought him in. Yeah, because uh, Mado Carrillo is a uh, nephew of, uh, of El Neto Fonseca. I did a bunch of stuff on this, in fact, recently for something. I was getting back into some of the history. Okay. Mm -hmm. El Greñas is Gilberto Ontiveros Lucero. Exacto. Gilberto Ontiveros Lucero. Uh, okay. But another, so, so I saw, okay, four figures of the Juarez Cartel in the 80s. Gilberto Ontiveros Lucero, El Greñas. Rafael Aguilar Guajardo. Guajardo, former uh, state police. Okay. Now, Rafael Muñoz Talavera. Uh huh. He was also he killed eventually in '98. And Amado Carrillo friends actually had him born in in Guamuchil. Ah, Guamuchil. Yeah. All right. All right. Okay. I mean, it's uh, all sorts of different little towns. And I mean, can you can you find if uh, if Amado Carrillo was uh, was the nephew of uh, of these oh, guys? Uh, well, this this was just like uh, some some of some notes I was uh, done and was taking here. Um, and some of the, the things. So, but, uh, but anyway, so basically um, they come in mm -hmm. and they, they take over. Well, he takes over. Now, what's the stories around Guajardo? Like this, I think Guajardo, Rafael Guajardo is like there first. And then maybe does ACF kill him or like send someone to kill him to take over the plaza or some mm -hmm. kind of dispute there. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And then, so after after Rafa Guajardo, who was a state police in, it was not even from Juarez. I think it was like from Asuncion or something. But it, it was in charge of the Juarez Plaza, right? Like mm. the Juarez border. Um, then he he was he was killed. He was murdered allegedly by Amado Carrillo or his people at least. And then Amado Carrillo comes into into play, and then he becomes a fucking legend by using aircrafts to transport uh tons and tons of cocaine into the US. So this 90s period is really when the Mexican cartels or the Mexican drug traffickers um really get into the cocaine business. Yeah. So we've got Colombians back in uh you know the Colombians you know back in the 70s Back in the days of the cocaine cowboys in Miami, flying it straight over the Caribbean, mm. straight into Florida. And then we got the South Florida Task Force shuts down that route. And then they put all the Navy ships and all the, you know, all the, you know, boats and all the, you know, whatever crazy military stuff there. So then the Colombians turn to the Mexicans and then they, they and this, this stuff happens gradually. You see, there's kind of these deals happening gradually. But then by the 90s, you get this big player. So you got, Amado Carrillo Fuentes in the center in Juarez. You've got uh, over in Tijuana, the Ariana Felix. And then you've got the uh, Gulf Cartel and um, Garcia Abrego over there. Now, yeah. there's, there's an interesting um, DEA report about this time. Uh, and it looks at, uh, at Amado Carrillo Fuentes. And, it, you know, it says that they, they, at that time, the DA are using the word cartel, but mm -hmm. they do say they do say they have like they talk about um they they they, they have they got all these like um flow charts in that um but they they talk about their how he's being working with all these different other traffickers across Mexico. So they got this like big chart here saying. You know, he's working with, with, with Chapo Guzman, Arona Felix. And they do say in that, well, the cartel idea is quite narrow in some ways because really these guys are all working with each other right across Mexico. Yeah. A bunch yeah. of these gangsters. Because um, I, I think what, what was happening back then when you start talking about the Colombia, the Colombia basically owned the trafficking business. They just, they just needed a new route. And that's where these different families from Sinaloa began, you know, like organizing as the Guadalajara organization or whatever. Like they moved to Jalisco. It was like, uh, este, eh, eh, 
¿cómo se llama? Miguel Ángel Félix Gallardo, el, el jefe de jefes, Ernesto Fonseca, el neto, en Rafael Caro Quintero. We were like the, they were like the, the, the biggest OGs that started, you know, trafficking weed and poppy from Sinaloa. And then they were like, dude, let's, let's offer this route to the Colombians and spike business. And Amado Carrillo y El Chapo and several other like small players were around these three guys, right? Like they were like running ads for these guys on, on the trafficking business. And then something happens, which, which is, I mean, at least for me, it's not super clear. They say it was the killing of agent, uh, the former D agent, Kiki Camarena, that kind of forced them to break into territories and send Amado Carrillo to Juarez to oversee the Juarez Plaza, including that includes Ojinaga. And, uh, and then uh, Los Arellano Felix brothers taking care of Tijuana. And then this other guy in, uh, in the east, northern, eastern part of, uh, of Mexico, Tamaulipas and, and all that region. But I'm not sure, like, if it was, I don't know if that was the, the single incident that kind of like made them break into different trips or if it was like a natural movement of business growing a lot and now they needed to distribute players along Mexico. So you see, look at the timeline. So Kika uh, Morena happens in like 85. 85. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's this famous meeting which they talk about where they divide the places. Mm -hmm. And that meeting, you know, that was detailed in uh, by Jesus Blanconelas mm -hmm. and his in his book El Cartel. And he talked about that being in Acapulco at this Hotel Las Brisas, mm -hmm. which is a big narco hotel. I mean, that's definitely true. Um, and then they talk about the give El Chapo Guzman, you know, Sonora. Um, which is why, I mean, Sinaloa, you're in Sinaloa and you want to go to the United States, you go bang north at Sonora. So that's, exactly. that is the Sinaloa. Yeah. And Ariana Felix get Tijuana. And then eventually uh, Carrillo Fuentes gets Juarez. Like, so I think there's mm -hmm. a bit of a dispute first with Guajardo, Rafael Guajardo, whatever, but he gets it. So with that cocaine, I think as well, what you see with the with taking over the business is initially the Colombians are paying the Mexicans a price per kilo. So we deliver you, you know, we give you the cocaine. You know, we'll get, you can come and get it in Panama or Colombia or whatever. We give you the cocaine, you take it and give it to us in the United States, and we'll pay you a price per kilo. Exactly. And then the Mexicans say, okay, look, we know we you know let's let's do a more deal here. And at one point it gets to being 50-50, like basically being. I'll, well, I'll deliver the cocaine. I'll keep 50% of it for ourselves, the Mexicans, and, and we'll give 50% back to the Colombians. Colombians. And then it becomes just, we're going to buy the cocaine off you for a set rate per kilo. We take care of it and it's ours and we're making the big money. So that kind of, and all this happens in the 90s on, under Amado Carrillo Fuentes. Now the planes, I mean, you know, he, he bought big planes, yeah? So it wasn't only... You know, the little Learjets, it was, you know, bigger, like Boeings mm. and stuff. And DC, you know, DC, whatever they are, DC 10s, whatever they are. And, and you, 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 recently, you recently told me that well, some of these planes are still out there, right? Like being used by the US government? Right. So there's a few things. So there was the guy that Marshall told us um, that these planes that have been, there's some planes that have been um, seized as asset seizures. So, I mean, it's kind of crazy, the, the asset seizure thing. I mean, they, they take billions of dollars worth of stuff, yeah. but they seize some of these planes and then they'll use them or use them for a time to fly around like prisoners and stuff. But there's also, there's a plane in Parral. If you go to the town of Parral, there's a, a plane of Amada Carrillo Fuentes there and it's been used as like a children's play park. No way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Check it out. Go to, go to, go to Parral. You go, there's a little park there. The plane's right there. You can jump in and out of it and stuff. And uh, yeah, yeah, I was there a couple of years ago. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Funny <laughs> story. Be kids <laughs> playing around a, uh, a narco plane from El Señor del Cielo. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so uh, what was it like? I mean, so ACF, um, obviously, we, we get to... Now, he avoids the the big, the worst beefs and in the early 90s so yeah. the worst beefs between chapel guzman and the ariana felix the murder of the cardinal all of that stuff he avoids 
those beefs and just casual trafficking drugs. Now, it's always hard to know with um, the real numbers, um, but he was meant to be, you know, the, the, the DA investigators and as people, they believed he could have been at one point after the fall of Pablo Escobar, he was the biggest in Mexico and maybe the biggest in the world mm-hmm. for a while. Now, now one, one, one uh, controversial thing, like basically Amado Carrillo gets to the, probably like to the top of his career when he starts putting a lot of planes into the U.S. and stuff. And then he undergoes this surgery, right? This face surgery in Mexico City. Yeah, yeah. So ninety, so ninety-seven. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, yeah. So we get to get to, just be, just before that. I mean, so we get to that to the to the surgery, and obviously this kind of crazy thing happens. But like, as well as that, I mean, he was his name comes up. You know, the, so his nickname, Lord of the Skies, so these planes, and Señor de los Cielos. We said they made the telenovela. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like, there was various references for like uh, Raboyo. When they got the uh, the Mexican drug czar who got arrested, he was arrested for working with Amado Carrillo Fuentes. Mm-hmm. I went to the court martial of two generals on trial for drug trafficking, court martial for drug trafficking, Quiros Hermosillo and Acosta Chaparro, oh, one of your um, un family members. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I don't have nothing to do with that Chaparro, but who the fuck knows? <laughs> okay, Quiros Hermosillo was a general. Mm-hmm. And the head of the guy who had been a, a high ranking federal police officer at the time, or federal at the time, described in the court martial that he witnessed Quiros Hermosillo with the Lord of the Skies, Amado Correa Fuentes, meeting at a VIPs on the Periferico in Mexico City. Wow, no fucking way. And when he said that, Quiros Hermosillo turned around and said, you're saying that you saw me meeting with this drug trafficker in the VIPs? And the guy, the policeman goes, see me, General. Oh, and he shit. Says, You're lying. That is a mentiroso. No, me, General. Oh, <laughs> Dude. <laughs> it was fucking drama, man. Fucking drama. Interesting. Um, but but anyway, so his, his name's, I mean, so he's, he's okay, he's the top, I mean, maybe biggest drug trafficker in Mexico, you know, huge amounts of money and has this plastic surgery. Um, you know, what the fuck happens? To change his face, allegedly. I mean, that's the thing. Like, do you think he really wanted to change his face because of he was like too recognizable now or because he really just wanted to look better? Because, I mean, he's no, not at all like we see in Narcos or in the Lord of the Skies telenovela, El Señor de los Cielos. He's not, doesn't look at all like Rafael Amaya or uh, Jose Maria Jaspic. I mean, not at all. These two guys are handsome guys, you know, with a, with a beard <laughs> and shit. And Amado Carrillo was ugly as fuck, man. Like, he, he was ugly. Yes, yes. <laughs> That's don't talk about that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't use that him. You don't want to hear him hearing it if he's still around somewhere. Um, <laughs> he, he, uh, well, I, I mean, I, 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 I'm not a, generally a conspiracy theorist, but I do believe that this. I, I've got, I've got a feeling this was a setup, and he faked his death. Yeah. To, to get, now, an interesting thing there as well uh, about Amado Carrillo Fuentes, different from a lot of other drug traffickers in Mexico. Most of these drug traffickers in Mexico, you so someone's like, it's the wondering where are they? Where are they hiding? Mm. And it turns out they're hiding in their village, you know, or they're hiding in the Sinaloan countryside, the yeah. Michoacan countryside. You know, where's you know El Chapo? You know, find them in Sinaloa. Where's Garo Quintero? Find them in Sinaloa. Where's you know La Tuta? Find them in Michoacan. They're in their territory, in their home turf. So they're not really worldly people they don't really know you know because you think you've got all that money and everyone's yeah. looking for you hide in you know Hawa- Italy, Italy Australia, for- Hawaii yeah. or whatever yeah yeah but then no they go to the place where they feel safe right when they feel like they're around their people and they and they know the place and they're they're, 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 they're very rooted when they've yeah. got deep roots yeah the difference with you look at 
uh, Amado. He was down there. Now, there's been a recently a massive case about all of this money of his in Argentina. He bought huge properties in Argentina, South America. So, you know, he was flying around. You know, he was in Cuba a lot. In Brazil. He, had a, he, he got married to a Brazilian woman, right? He has a yeah, Brazilian. Cuban, I mean, there was a Cuban one. There was a big like, uh, Afro-Cuban woman, I think. or uh, She was in Narcos. They put her as Afro-Cuban, I think. But she was a Cuban woman. He had, he had, you know, he probably he might have had a Brazilian as well. I mean, he, you know, these, they can have a lot of wives, yeah, or a lot of, a lot of that. And but, that's the thing. That's that's one of the, that's one of the, my my first memories about like the narco world and the, and the and the word narco was about Amado Carrillo. I was I was in this elementary school, uh, uh, private elementary school in Juarez, where you know, like the wealthiest people in Juarez and politicians and shit. Like the kids were in that school. Uh, a Catholic school, uh, non, nonetheless. And one of uh, Milo Carrillo's sons was in my classroom. So I wow. remember I remember one time at least, uh, Milo showing up with a lot of other men, all suit, suit up, you know, like they were, they were wearing like suits um, and knocking on the door and asking the teacher for, uh, uh, ¿cómo se llama? Andresito, one of his sons. Um, Maestra, puedo hablar con Andresito, but it was like in the middle of the day, in the middle of a, of a, of a, of a school. And I remember he was driving these couple of, uh, I think they were navigators or some stuff like that, like flashy black cars back then. And he had at least two wives in that same school, that same, that same elementary school. <laughs> so the talk always was like, oh, he's, uh, she's the lover or and yeah, or she's the wife and you know like there was always like these rumors about the two wives of Amado Carrillo and the same school and i i mean he he literally went to that school once never saw him again uh i lost the track the trace of uh, of, of andresito but then met another nephew of Amado Carrillo in college in a private school in the Tecnológico de Monterrey when i was in college uh and then when they killed Amado Carrillo's uh, nephew in, in Juarez, and in, we're talking now like 2009, 2007, something like that, uh, this guy had to take over part of the organization that his dad was still overseeing. I remember we were at a final uh, exam, uh, as the examen final, um, and then he got a call on his uh, Nextel radio. The, the, the Nextel was were huge back then, two way radios, um, and it, like everything was silent. His radio kept like making this noise. I, I remember he was driving a Porsche uh, with uh, with two security guards, with two fucking guaros guaros behind him. He answered, and everyone was like, well, "The teacher was like, you can answer. You're in the middle of a test." And he only put his finger like, you know, it's like he answered that call was to let him know that they were they just killed his dad and he disappeared from from school. And allegedly he started running or overseeing the organization or the operations of the Juarez cartel back then. So I've been I mean, the, the Juarez cartel and Amado Carrillo and his families and all that stuff have been around my, you know, like grew up. And and I think that was one of the main reasons I decided to jo to go into journalism because I was like and, and and report and investigate about like narcos because I kept hearing like all these guys and uh, seeing Amado Carrillo and then uh, there was this clown in in Ciudad Juarez called um Botoncito he was like mm -hmm. very popular he used to be a lawyer but he also was a clown for for kids and I found a photo of Botoncito with the Arellano Felix back in the nineties. Um, of course, he got threatened by Amado Carrillo because he was going to the parties of the Carrillo of the of the Arellano Felix and not to the parties of Andresito. And I found a photo of Botoncito with the Arellano Felix brothers, and I sent it over on Facebook to Botoncito like probably like five years ago, <laughs> and he only said, "Oh, what a funny moments." <laughs> funny <Yeah. times. laughs> so so. So, okay, so Amado Carrillo Fuentes, he, they don't, they don't know the basic story. He goes, gets plastic surgery, supposedly to change his face and has a plan, dies was, in the plan. He was trying to look more like Jaspic than, than what he looked like in real life. I was like, I want to look like, 
various plastic surgeries. <laughs> so, he, <laughs> so he would go through it. And I, how, how often is people dying in plastic surgery? It does not seem a very common thing to happen. Um, you get plastic surgery and die. And specifically the face, right? Like let's say let's say you're 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 doing like a tummy tuck. Probably you can die from a you know like a surgery in your belly. Yeah. But from from the face, I don't think it's that. I don't think it's. I mean, I mean, I don't think it's that easy to get killed or that you die. Um, we're gonna go to a commercial yeah. toss. We'll Great. Back. And we get to get back with post ACF, the Juarez Cartel, the war with Chapo, and now. Absolutely. And let's uh, let's go to this commercial break to thank our sponsors of the show. All our major sponsors, yeah, yeah, yeah all, our major, all our major patrons. Back okay. Let me stop right here. Mis compas, there is no way YouTube is going to monetize this video. So if you're finding this interview interesting and insightful, please make sure you hit the super thanks button below this video to make a donation. Many, many thanks for your kind support, compas. And we're back from the uh, commercial break. Oh, shit. Uh, whereas ACF... We left at an important moment, right? ACF Big goes one. surgery. 97. So 97. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's what out of a million crazy stories in the drug trafficking world. I mean, this is one of the craziest ones, isn't it? Maybe yeah. the biggest drug trafficker in the world is huge guy. Everyone is payroll. And it dies from plastic surgery. And then all the doctors end up uh, dead and dissolved yeah. in acid? Yeah. Shitty shit, no? Now, I heard secondhand a journalist saying they talked to an agent who said they saw his body and it was him. But What do you mean? They saw his body and it was him. So, I mean, and, and also the, the, the death certificate had another name, right? Allegedly because he was trying to cover up his... Uh, oh, real dead. identity. Where where is the body now? I think no, I don't know, man. That's another thing. Like, where is the <laughs> fucking buried? Right? Yeah. I guess that that's, that's the only way to to actually know to go take out his body from his <laughs> from, from his grave. Okay. And what do a DNA test against uh, one of the family members? One of the family members. But uh, but to me, I mean, it looks so suspicious. And, you know, you got a, a motivation. But, you know, if he did get out of the drug trafficking business, that's, you know, there's very few of them have done that, who have kind of walked yes. away at that level. I mean, no, yes, one, because... no one on that level has walked away, on that high level, the peak of their game, that amount of money and power. But, I mean, also, I guess one of the reasons you can't walk away, you talk to some of these guys and they say, what's it like? And they're like, one of the things they say is, the power they feel mm. having that money, but having that power, yeah. life and death, walking around with impunity, you know, cops protecting them, you know, just that's a hard, it's, it's a buzz to walk around, you know, walk away from. It's the same as these guys who are like dictators and stuff. Like, why can they not leave power? It's like, yeah. I've got, you know, I can't walk away from this. Yes. Um, and, and another another thing you, you brought up earlier, and I think makes sense into like the profile of Amado Carrillo, is that he was no, he was not like the other traffickers that always go. I mean, he, he knew the world. He was, tra he was like a smart and probably better educated in that sense. Right. Like, so if someone was to pull off a trick like that, like let's let's play it as if like, that it was going to be Amado Carrillo. His his mind is not the same as the other guys. Starting with using airplanes to traffic cocaine, that's a fucking mastermind. Um, you know, like traveling the world, having like marrying in Cuba, Brazil, putting money in Argentina. Um, I mean, he was not like the other dudes. So so it would it would make sense that he had this master play of you know killing himself and getting out of business while he was at the very top um not the first one or the last one i remember this uh guy from i think it was from portugal uh this not, huge narco from portugal that um during the COVID, he faked his dad and he had a fake that certificate to COVID, but then he was captured in germany or some shit like that recently <laughs> okay okay yeah so something, someone try to try the Okay, anyway, so so ACF is out the game by either dying or 
faking his own death and managing to leave the game. And his brother, VCF, Vicente Carrillo Fuentes, the Viceroy. El Viceroy. Takes over. Oh. And, uh, I mean, his reputation is, is a kind of violent reputation, would you say? Or what's his reputation? Yes, I think I think when El Viceroy took over after 97, I mean, there was a lot of different things happening because we were switching from the 90s to the 2000s. And that was a major change in every industry in Mexico, in the U.S., specifically for a border like Ciudad Juarez. Everything was like changing. And one of those changes had to do with El Viceroy taking over. He relied more on business, on, on, on violence to keep you know like his turf in in place but but also he brought some violent former police officers to take care of the plaza right like he he brought uh i can't remember the fucking name of this guy but uh, like this huge fat guy who started you know basically creating what was to become eventually la linea mm. um a lot of former police officers very violent and he started picking up violent violence, not only in Ciudad Juarez, but in the whole state of Chihuahua. Um, not sure if he was fighting the Sinaloans or who he was fighting back then in, in the 2000s. But there was no like shootouts in the streets. There was a lot of encobijados. People was, you know, like taken from the streets, killed at a certain place and then wrapped in, uh, in um, blankets and thrown out of the streets. He, El Viceroy, I think, was really known in Ciudad Juarez for first, not getting a lot of like control around the city or the state. And second of all, because uh, he was encobijando every single fucking player, police officer, et cetera, et cetera, in, in Juarez. So also this time period, we get the women of Juarez becoming a big mm -hmm. global issue. The late 90s, early 2000s. Now, there's a lot of theories behind it. So you get a lot of uh, women being kidnapped and murdered and raped. I mean, in huge numbers. One of the theories, and this is when you first start hearing La Linea as well, was that the, their network of corrupt police were known as the, the La Linea, the line of corrupt police. Yeah. And they were involved in this as well, um, along with the, with the traffickers, and were just like systematically picking up a particularly young woman you know, walking back from factories, picking them up, raping them and murdering them. Yes. Um, and also that was an, another change of the, of the changes I was talking about, like the the, establish, the establishment of maquiladoras, so of this U.S. factory in, in Ciudad Juarez starts developing the city at a faster pace. And it starts creating a local consumption market, huge for, for El Viceroy or for the, uh, or, or the uh, Carrillo Fuentes organization. Uh, and that also, it's kind of like a game changer for that organization and creates a lot more violence in the city. Antes, like before, Amado Carrillo Fuentes was strictly trafficking drugs into the U.S. and getting money from that. But El Viceroy established a huge market, of uh, a local market of, uh, of drug selling in the, in the city. And, and that changed the city for forever until this day. Now, 2004, back in Sinaloa, is a murder of Rodolfo Vicente, uh, Rodolfo Carrillo Fuentes, Fuentes, the brother. Now, one story. So, now this is by apparently it's on orders from El Chapo. One story is that you know there was like even he refused to shake El Chapo's hand or something. There was some disrespect, and they ordered him to be killed. You know, whatever. Other thing was that, you know that they they. The people said they didn't like him. They didn't like um, uh, Vicente Carrillo Fuentes. I mean, La Barbie, one of his Barbie interviews, he goes like, "They didn't like him." You know, Chapo and and Mother didn't like this guy. Um, but anyway, they kill Rodolfo Carrillo Fuentes. Now, there's a little bit of um, a difference, or a little bit of an unclear thing. Some of the old uh, indictments on this, the DA, well, the U.S. indictments. They say from 2004 onwards, the Juarez cartel and the Sinaloa cartel were split after that murder. Yeah. But other things, which actually seems to be they carried on working together, despite that murder, they carried on working together. 
And some of the testimony, the amazing testimony we discovered uh, from the trial of El Pariente mm. in El Paso. So that testimony, they talk about, they had guys there talking about the plazas and talking about them through the, through the 2000s and that it was still, you know, working with Sinaloans and, you know, Juarez. They were still working together right up until 2008 yes, when the war yes. breaks down. Exactly. I think in 2008, the, 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 like this war, so-called war, like, hit the city, but probably, probably began before, like pretty, could, could easily have been started like since 2004 when, with that, like with that killing of, of, of Rodolfo uh, Carrillo Fuentes in, in Sinaloa. The thing is also like the Sinaloans didn't have any grasp at a border city to traffic. So they had to pay either the, 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 um, the ¿cómo se llama? Los Arellano Felix or the Carrillo Fuentes or the guys at uh, Tamaulipas at that area. So they so they wanted to own also a a border so they didn't so they didn't have to pay, you know, like a way through into the US. They were like kind of fed up of paying always for using that turf to traffic drugs. And that was also a main a main background, like what a main setup before this war started. Probably not only the killing of Rodolfo but this these two these two organizations began Fighting uh, these awful fucking wars in the in the street of uh, in the streets of Juarez and using a lot of local gangs to to fight each other. Um, there's people saying that that war and that because they literally exterminated each other. Like there was no more fucking people to to keep fighting in the city. Uh, many others said like they they got a truce. We 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 heard from sources at the time you were here, right? That they basically split the city in two over one of the main streets in Juarez. Okay, re rewinding a bit, rewinding a second. So we got this, so we got it, anyway, 2008. So we got this war happens. So the, the real war goes 2008 to 2012. 12. Now, in that time, or 2008 to 2011, in the four years, I think it's 10,000 murders mm -hmm. in Juarez. And that's when it's like, you know, like the most murderous city in the world and crazy. This is really when the Mexican drug war really gets to a different level. Yeah. So, I mean, El Chapo's man and El Mayo and the Sinaloans want to take off, take the city away from, from the Viceroy. And they've got these different trafficking groups and so, so some of the characters who are already in, so this is typical of pretty much all of the turf wars in Mexico the last 20 years. You have different groups in these areas who are allied with these outside force. Yeah. So some of the different um, traffickers and the, the heavy traffickers in the Juarez area were, um, you know, went with, uh, with, the, with El Chapo and then some of them went with them. Now, so as well as that, and you, you're saying this, they recruit the street gangs. Yes. So the first ones to bring in the street gangs is, so like the Sinaloa thing, well, we could take the city, and they bring in a lot of troops. The, the former mayor of, um, of Ciudad Juarez, the mayor, who's the mayor around this time, and a quite open guy for an interview. Era um, Teto Murguia, no? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, him or the one before, before anyway. And he was describing to me one time how they told him the turf war was the war was going to happen on this mm -hmm. date. So the turf war was going to it's going to kick off. They yeah. told him, and, it, it, and it yes. went bang. And that's also like the, the La Línea was already established. Like, it was like the, yeah. like back when this was happening. La Línea was was big, was known, and it had like probably several dozens of of local police officers uh, as enforcers for the Juarez cartel. When the Sinaloans come in. So these gangs and people they send over to Juarez, they put up a list of of oh, yeah. police officers, right? To that they were going to start killing one by one, and they set up a list in one of the main streets in Ciudad Juarez with with names and saying like, for those who don't want to believe, that they set up a list and they start killing one by one of these police officers. I think they got to kill like ten of them from the list. Uh, and and that, that that was like dude, uh, that was terrifying to leave in Ciudad Juarez. That was that was like what the fuck is happening? Someone leaving out a list of names of police officers. I mean, we're kind of like used to seeing violence, 
but not like not like that. That was fucking terror in the streets. And then I remember these guys, they they left hanging out of a of a bridge uh, with a face of a pig. Mm. And one of the first propagandas, like on, a pro- online propagandas, started with La Linea. They had a channel, a YouTube channel called Quita Puercos. Um, I mean, it, it was uh, the, actually the Sinaloa cartel. They, they, they were, the, the, the channel was called Quita Puercos, and they exposed very graphically every police officer they killed they tortured um and yes and and they they they, uh, there was like a lot of information it was like propaganda right like they were like we are the sinaloa cartel with almost los chapos and these officer and these officer and these uh we killed them because they were working with the um state prosecutor la patricia gonzalez um, that was uh, absolutely in bed with the Juarez cartel, and she now holds a federal high-level position in Mexico. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, so so Sinaloa cartel goes in there, starts killing all the police, the local police, who are on the payroll of the Juarez cartel. They kill them, and they get a typical stuff. They kill them because they want them to work for them. Yeah. But also, is, you know, they're, they're fighting over who controls the police. And then the Barrio Azteca, who's this curious cross-border gang formed in prisons in Sierra Juarez, sorry, prisons in Texas. In Texas. Going back to the 80s. I've had members deported. And so they're a weird uh, gang. But also they started working quite closely with the Juarez cartel. And then they take up arms and so it looks like the Juarez cartel could be finished, but then this gang, the Barra Azteca, take up all their guns, and there's just thousands of them as well. And then they just start carrying out brutal massacres. Yeah. And then you've got so then the Sinaloans also start recruiting gang members. Mm-hmm. And you have the artist assassins. Los artistas asesinos. Dobla, doblados, doblas. And I, I went to a house one time of a woman who was, her son was in the artist assassins and she used to let them all hang in her house. And one of the original founders, a guy called Seek, and he was like a graffiti artist. She showed me some paintings he did and they were pretty cool kind of, and that's why they were artist assassins. Cause they were like graffiti mm-hmm. writers, painters who were also killing people. That's and then he, he, he'd been recruited. They were like a street gang. You know, one of those like many, many street gangs in Juarez, and the Sinaloa cartel recruited them, gave them guns, and they they blew up and became really big. They also uh, recruited the Mexicles. That's when the Mexicles started going going yeah. huge. So it was like, but that's that's a weird thing, man. Like, if we agree that the Sinaloa cartel kind of won that war, uh, it's it's a, it's a nifty thing. But I mean, what what do you think? Like, let's I, I don't, we're gonna I go don't back think, to. I don't think they won. I, I think. I think it was, uh, I think it was a draw. Mm-hmm. Um, in the the Sinaloa cartel went in there, and they couldn't wipe out and knock out the Juarez cartel and the Barra Azteca and La Línea. Yeah, but also the Juarez cartel and La Línea Barra Azteca couldn't force out the Sinaloa cartel, so it ended up being okay. We divide the city. Yeah, and going going back to that, like that's the thing. Let's like the players the Juarez cartel had, who seem like enough to get rid of the fucking Sinaloa cartel, like in a second, right? Because you had La Línea, a lot of uh, local police officers with, you know, like permission basically to kill and hold arms and stuff. You have Los Aztecas, binational gang with a lot of members. We're talking like over twenty thousand members back then. And and other like smaller gangs, you know, like mixed with another s- s- small gangs and, and and all the players of the of the Juarez cartel. The Sinaloa cartel only had artistas asesinos and mexicles, but the and gente nueva. Yeah. And you're going to say probably the federal police, the military. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. That was the where I was going. Like that's it's basically how they took over Juarez. And uh, you know, in this in this fighting. Because the federal police are backing up the Sinaloa cartel, or that's what the Juarez cartel is saying, you get this bomb, this IED, yeah, which is used to kill the federal police. 
Mm-hmm. I remember, remember when that, you know, that happened and it was like, you know, they're really doing this. That, that was another big escalation. Now, Diego was one of the, the ones behind this or accused of being behind this. And one of the real warlords, the war criminals of the Juarez cartel, of La Linea. And when they eventually arrested him, finally they beat him up, the federal police beat him up really bad. This is what the, the marshal was telling us. They beat him up real bad. And when he was extradited and he gave testimony in this trial against El Pariente, he was kind of blind or partially blind. And might have, mm-hmm. They bashed him in the head so badly during that torture later on. Yes, exactly. So that's that's that was like still during the war between both both cartels before they split the city, right? Like the I mean we're talking like 2009, 2010, 2011, 12, 13, 13 like violence starts coming down a bit. Some people say because of the extermination of both sides. 2014, if I'm not mistaken, they arrested Viceroy. They 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 lock right. him up in 2014, right? So yeah, yeah, just get to that that truce a second. No, I mean the violence goes right down. You look at the murder rate at its peak in 2010, mm-hmm. going down to like by like 2012, 2013, it goes down like 90 percent. Yeah. Um. So you know you were getting you know 300, 400 murders a month, it was insane in 2010. It suddenly gets like 30 murders, you know, 20, 30 murders a month. So it goes down. I mean, that's still for any other city. If you were like in, in a lot of cities in the world, that'd be a lot of murders. But like compared to how crazy it was. So I might this this truce is like the so truce is um El Tecnologico, that big, big road that cuts through Juarez, mm-hmm. divides the city. Then you've got one side, Barrasteca, Linea, you know, Juarez Cartel. Other side, gente nueva, um, and they also control the wet the area to the east that goes into uh, El Valle El Valle. Juarez mm-hmm. and all that area. They can still traffic their drugs over, um, and yeah, I mean, as and other factors like there's not enough people left to kill, yeah. and there's a bunch of social work money comes in around that time as well. You know, yes. it was like you know a bunch of U.S. aid and and you know, all this stuff. Yeah, exactly. So basically, they 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 split the city. They they split the. It, it, they even back then they split the um, they split the criminal activities. I remember like the, basically like the Juarez cartel, La Línea, El Barrio Azteca managed all the uh, human smuggling operations, and the Sinaloa cartel was not doing anything of that. Um, both of them were trafficking kind of like the same drugs, but Juarez was trafficking more heroin than cocaine as compared with the Sinaloa cartel was trafficking more cocaine and both of them were trafficking weed or marijuana like across the, across the border. Um, so so yeah, like that was like the, the truce. They arrested El Viceroy. Um, can't remember, were they arrested? Where, where did they arrest him? Like in, in, in Chihuahua yeah. State or can't remember? Yeah, yeah, it was like somewhere like uh, Garetaro or something crazy. It was like- Yeah, right, it was like in a total well, different state. Yeah, it was somewhere like, uh, um, I mean, God, just, but like the, we bring it up so because I'm uh, thinking about it now where they got him. Yeah, had it down here, Coahuila. In Coahuila, well, it's a weird fucking place to be hiding, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it was funny. I mean, I guess Coahuila from from Chihuahua, you go over there. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's kind of in 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 still in the vicinity in a way. Now, Advisor Roy, he's arrested under Peña Nieto, and one mm-hmm. of the things sometimes we forget about Peña Nieto is. Under his government, they got a lot of kingpins. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, they got basically, of the major cartels, okay, they got, you know, they got BCF. Mm-hmm. BCF. They got El Chapo twice. Chapo twice. Mm-hmm. Uh, they got uh, La Tuta and Nacera Morena were taken down. Mm-hmm. Um, They got uh, Miguel Angel Trevino. Uh-huh. Um. So a lot of a lot of you know, mm-hmm. you know kingpins. So Peña Nieto, you know, I mean, he's a terrible president, but and 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 he, you know, it was in a lot of the the policy, the narco policy was like, uh, talk about other stuff, you know, we don't discuss narco stuff. We change the you know change the conversation, change the narrative was one of the one of the phrases they had floating around their administration, but they were taking out 
kingpins. Now, yeah. was the strategy take out kingpins so that the government tries to retake this this business, or or like when this when it, it, well, it's very very blurry when the viceroy was taken out, who really takes over the cartel? Um, and then and then that's where we get to now how it's operating now and stuff. Yeah, I, I think. Yeah, you're, you're totally right. Like what was what what Peña Nieto did, I think, was more a political move, like a political statement, because we we were coming from the previous president, Felipe Calderón, who was like rumored to be in bed with the Sinaloa cartel, and his top chief police officer was Genaro García Luna, who's now in prison in New York, for allegedly being part of the Sinaloa cartel. So I think Peña Nieto tried to like go the opposite right like we're now we're gonna grab like a single uh, let's grab one kingpin from every single organization all over mexico so i can get rid of that press of like a president being in bed with narcos right um and that's that's i mean that was that's kind of like an impressive job i mean yes Peñaneto was one of the shittiest presidents we had but uh that was some impressive work where they're like getting a lot of kingpins from different organizations kind of make the kind of like set up the tone for what we're living now a lot of like smaller gangs more violent and dealing with a lot of shit you know <laughs> yeah yeah so anyway so so bcf is out in now it's it's fun he was he was sentenced um you know he hasn't been extradited and i don't mm -hmm. know how much the americans want to pressure for him um but considering how much he unleashed that war there and you know he wasn't I think his sentence wasn't for this like mass murder. His sentence was for drug trafficking in Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, he's in prison here. So anyway, so VCF is taken out. And then we've got now. So like today, you know, what's the story uh, in our last uh, nine minutes? What's it right now? 2023. Post Armado, post VCF, post Chapel. You know what? What's it like now in Juarez? What's happening in Juarez now? So, uh, like, I have the impression again that the Juarez cartel only exists now as, as as a name, as a brand, but it doesn't really exist. And that's my take. We could probably disagree and then look further into if that organization exists. That's all because like you you don't hear from the organization, you don't see the organization operating as as huge. You you see La Línea, which were previously the enforcers, now being handled by a completely different players um and probably operating more on the center of the state like in the sierra de chihuahua and, and the almada like that those kind of places and then also the barrio azteca split mm. uh, and la linea split so la linea split into two la linea and la la el nuevo cartel de juarez what they call the nuevo cartel de juarez which uh, kind of like is uh, started like doing alliances with the Sinaloa cartel in Chihuahua. And then El Barrio Azteca split in two, La Vieja Guardia del Barrio Azteca and La Empresa. La Empresa stayed with La Línea. I mean, La, la Empresa went with the uh, Nuevo Cartel de Juarez and kind of like the Sinaloa cartel and Los Mexicles. Y La Vieja Guardia del Barrio Azteca stayed, you know, with, with La Línea. And when that happened in Juarez, again, we had, we, we watched like, violence spiking bad again in, in, in the city. Um, mostly people from the Barrio Azteca killing each other for, you know, like uh, treason in, you know, the, the Barrio Azteca and going with the, with the Mexicles and alliance with that. Well, one thing we can say about now is that you've you know, now got, okay, a massive human smuggling business, mm -hmm. which wasn't, you know, now, you know, so you had the migration flows um, and everyone who came over the southern border of Mexico, they would go up to the Rio Grande Valley. It was the first thing. Then they shut that down or tried to clamp down on that. So they moved over to Coahuila. They clamped down on that. And they moved over to Juarez El Paso. It's become the biggest area for migrants, asylum seekers crossing. A lot of money in that. So a lot of these groups, Barra Azteca, Mexicles, all of these groups into human smuggling. And that's, that's a huge boom business. I mean, it's worth, you know, hundreds of millions maybe billions of dollars I one mean, of those guys told me that they're making more money now from smuggling people than trafficking cocaine right right so, okay yeah. i mean absolutely because yeah. cocaine price particularly you know going down mm -hmm. so so they're all into that so they're all into the human smuggling stuff it's one of the things now 
Second thing is, um, you know, that local drug market we talked about before they began in the you know the late nineties, two thousands. That is matured massively. Huge local market, huge amount of people, deportees, locals uh, taking particularly crystal meth. Yeah, that's the that's the biggest seller. Yeah, yeah? crystal meth or or everything, crystal meth, cocaine. Yeah, everything. Uh, fentanyl, some fentanyl on the streets there as well. Yes, exactly. I mean, it's not popping huge in the streets, but it's definitely being large seizures of of fentanyl that are meant to be across the border. Um, and uh, and also a third player in 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 Juarez arrived a couple of years ago. Uh, the Cartel Jalisco Nueva Generación. They they started uh making alliances with uh with La Línea. To, to operate in, in Juarez. The Cartel Jalisco usually doesn't arrive to a city like to fight a turf. They usually make alliances and what, what they do is they just want to put money into the into the city to start laundering, start their own operations of trafficking stuff and all that shit. So so we do have Cartel Jalisco no generation here. It's not super visible because again, they work through alliances and they are not doing you know something super visible or huge uh, where they want to take over the turf or whatever uh but but that's also happening these days so so yes the that i mean that that's the that's the but like going back to the to, to what's left of the cartel i mean you know the source we spoke to who seemed pretty informed you know that we were out there and, and that guy seemed pretty informed about the the streets and was operating a uh, law enforcement operating on the streets there and was saying that 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 basic division post the war still stands yeah. Now, you know, you've got the Barrio Azteca and he talked about like, you know, 4,000 Barrio Azteca, a couple of thousand Mexicans, a couple of thousand artist assassins. And then still um, a coherent organization of drug trafficking of the Juarez cartel of like Plaza bosses. Now, La Linea as well, you've got La Linea um, operating very deeply in Chihuahua. I mean, deeply in terms of they're much more involved in a lot of local control of territory going right down through Chihuahua in all those different municipalities as yes. well. Exactly. Um, and so, um, so yeah, just to, to finish off now, a kind of a, a quite a bloody new situation, kind of disorder or, 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 or kind of a uneasy order of local players. If there is still one boss for the Juarez cartel, and there are some names that are out there, Juan Pablo Ladesma is one name you hear sometimes. Yeah, probably, probably. I mean, there's rumors also that he's, he's dead, like he's, right. he's not alive. But again, like, that's yeah. the thing. The Juarez cartel is way more hermetic than the Sinaloa cartel. You kind of like get the, can track down the players and the movements of the Sinaloa cartel. But the Juarez cartel, starting with Amado Carrillo Fuentes and his dad, it's blurry. It's, it's more hermetic. It's not, we don't get like track. We get a lot of like blind spot with these organization, particularly. So right now, I mean, the message that it's basically out there is that there is no plaza boss in, in Juarez. And I mean, I don't know, man, I get the feeling that is a, a market open for, for, for business, you know, like for someone to oh, come and oh, take oh. it over. Or if there is like, I mean, if there is a Plaza boss, it's not announcing the name. Yeah. But I, I, I don't think, I mean, if you're going to go up and these, say these territories, you still have people there. So you have the the local Plaza bosses and areas. I mean, I don't know you could just go up there and just start like trafficking drugs through, like back in the 80s or whatever, whatever and just start moving drugs through there. There's probably be people still with. Uh, but anyway, a, uh, a kind of bloody uneasy situation. Last words, is it going to get, a, would you say, running up to the 2024 election, um, you feel things could be unleashed, the war could come back to 20, you know, back to the 20, 2008 kind of times, or you, or, or what's your feeling about what it's like I, going forward? Yeah, no, I definitely think that we're going to see a spike in violence again next year, because again, like I think the feeling that we have from Juarez is that it's an open and, you know, like market for the first uh, buyer you know like who's gonna who's gonna head this plaza because right now we have like different small players with the barrio azteca la empresa los mexicles you know what happened with those mexicles in el neto uh, escaping prison killing 10 prison guards before getting killed himself so now the mexicles are, are paralyzed and without a for uh, like a litter 
Um, so there's like no visible leadership in this city. And I think that's going to bring some fucking trouble for, for next next year. Um, our time is running out. We have one minute left. This okay. was a crazy ride. Last guy, Naka report then the rise and fall of the Sierra Juarez cartel. Um, you heard it here, you heard it all here from Luis Chaparro and Joan Grillo. El Grillo. El Grillo. And so yeah, yeah. Check out, subscribe, follow, love. And hit the super thanks button, make donations, because we have major sponsors. But they still don't pay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, man. Peace out there. Peace out. See you around, man. It's me again, Compass. How do you like the interview? If you find this interview interesting and insightful, I'm going to ask you for a favor. Please share this to someone you think is going to find this interesting and enjoyable. And also, make sure you make a small or large donation through the super thanks button below this video. That's going to make a huge difference for me to keep bringing you these guests and keep traveling around finding the most insightful and interesting stories. Muchas gracias, compas.